Yuan Pao Wu is the uh, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada, and he is the chair of this panel. Um, the conference has worked closely with the Asia Pacific uh, Foundation of Canada. It's a partner, um, and Mr. Pao Wu is a uh, leading uh, voice on, on Asian issues, and we're very proud at the CIC to uh, have this collaboration with you, sir, and, and your leadership of this panel. Uh, Peter Harder mentored uh, Weibo, and I, I, this might be a good opportunity to say that we have uh, reached out to the Canadian Embassy in Beijing, and they, fellow Canadians, you'll be proud to know, only after the Americans, always of course after the Americans, we have the second largest number of Weibo followers from our embassy in all of China. And that means we have 300,000 Weibo followers in China. And notice of this conference and, and interaction on this conference is, is happening with Weibo followers. And in fact, the first question uh, in the question period after this panel will be a question from uh, a Weibo tweeter. So uh, stay tuned for that as the first question at the end of this panel. And now, Mr. Pawu, I pass a, the gavel, so to speak, to you. Thank you, David. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure for me to chair the session and for the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada to be a partner in this event. I want to congratulate the National Capital Branch for organizing uh, this conference, which is very much focused on a forward-looking agenda for the Canada-China relationship. And you will see in your program that this session has been uh, labeled uh, Economic Potential Strategic Partners with a question mark. Uh, the organizers are being playful with the question mark, and I'm going to interpret this question mark not as a question of whether we have a strategic partnership, because we, we do, but I'm going to interpret as how we construct this strategic partnership. So the tone, the nature of this discussion, I'd very much like to channel in the direction of the ways in which Canada and China uh, our strategic partners, the ways in which we could deepen the strategic uh, relationship. We have a very distinguished panel with us. I won't uh, have time to go through their bios, but the information is in your package. So if you allow me, uh, with the indulgence of my panelists, I will just go directly into the Q&A session. Uh, what we will do is have a bit of dialogue uh, on the podium amongst ourselves. I have the great luxury of asking all the questions, but then I will turn to the audience uh, perhaps uh, half an hour before the end. Uh, we've been given some extra time till about 11.15, I believe, so we'll spend the last half an hour or so taking questions, starting with, of course, our uh, Weipo questioner. By the way, I, I'm, I'm sure some of you are tweeting as well, and I hope you, you do that. Uh, do we have a Twitter handle for this conference? CIC China? Okay, so for those of you who've got your, your Twitter accounts out, uh, CIC China is the handle. Uh, let me start with our guest, uh, distinguished guest from um, the Carnegie Endowment for Peace in Washington, D.C., Professor uh, Huang uh, Yukon, uh, and ask him to give us a sense of what the China of uh, a decade from now might look like, because uh, this obviously will condition the way in which we think about a strategic partnership. If there's one thing that I've learned about China, and, and many of you likely will agree with this, is that if you expect uh, a certain trajectory of change in China over a certain period of time, the safe bet is that it's going to happen faster than you think. Uh, the only question, of course, is what that trajectory might be and what the direction of change might be. Professor Huang uh, is a very distinguished uh, China scholar and China watcher. He, of course, lived in China and worked uh, heading the World Bank office there. He was there when China entered the WTO in 2001. So let me start with you, uh, Dr. Huang. Uh, what will the Chinese economy look like? What will the drivers be of the Chinese economy a decade from now. Thank you very much. Uh, if you think China is already pretty big, 10 years from now the economy will be twice as large as it is currently. There's not going to be just 150 million people in the middle class, there'll be 450 million people. China is 52% urban today. 
In 10 years, my guess is it'll be 65% urban. This is going to transform the country. Your image of China today is largely focused on places like Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Chongqing. But 10 years from now, you're going to be very familiar with provinces like Henan, Hunan, provinces with populations of 100 million. And the reason I mention these places is that growth in China is moving inland. From about two or three years ago, and not many people recognize this, that the inland provinces are growing substantially faster than the coastal ones. So there's going to be sea change in the locus of activity. And what will be the, the focus of that sea change? China will be less what I would call trade-oriented, externally oriented. It'd be more consumption-oriented. Its service sector, which is 42% of the economy today, will be closer to 55. And this means that provinces which are at the center of the logistical chain, the movements north, south, east, west, will see a great deal more focus. China's exchange rate is today under a lot of debate because many people believe that it's undervalued. The China 10 years from now will probably run trade deficits. It's going to be more consumption oriented. So the renminbi will actually be probably declining rather than increasing. There'll be a lot of money flowing out of China. Today, maybe $100, $150 billion of foreign direct investment is flowing into China. But 10 years from now, $150 billion of money will be flowing out of China. It'll be flowing to countries like Canada, Latin America, and Africa. And people have to realize that that's going to be a sea change in how we think about global financial issues. The renminbi will probably be the medium of exchange in East Asia, not necessarily globally, but in East Asia, since China dominates the production sharing network. And the bulk of the flow and trade and goods and services is between countries like Japan, Taiwan, Korea, Thailand. And most of that settlement will probably be in renminbi. So this is going to be a sea change, and we have to think about China a completely different perspective. That's very helpful. Um, a doubling of the Chinese economy in 10 years means 7.2% uh, annual growth rate over the next 10 7 years. 7.5%. 7.5%, yes. mm -hmm. roughly. Uh, so you would be on the somewhat bullish side, I guess, of the uh, China forecasters. This, I'm not challenging you on this, uh, but it really paints a, a picture of a very different China 10 years from now. One, as you say, that is driven more by consumption rather than by investment, and running a trade deficit, you say, a current account yes. deficit by that time. So a China we really don't recognize uh, based on uh, 2013 perspective. We'll come back to you on that. Uh, let me turn to uh, Professor Chang uh, Tianping from the National Development and Reform Commission. Many of you know NDRC is a very powerful agency under the State Council of China. They determine much of the uh, economic direction of the country. Professor Chang, in particular, uh, spends a lot of time thinking about uh, China's international relationships, international cooperation, uh, thinking about uh, strategic partnerships that China has with uh, various countries. I want to ask him uh, to put into context the Canada-China strategic partnership, which <coughs> Ambassador Liu mentioned was, uh, was announced in 2005, when, when you were ambassador, of course. Uh, tell us, uh, Professor Chang, where the Canada-China strategic partnership sits in relation to China's growing number of strategic partnerships with other countries. Where do we rank, if you will? Okay. Uh, actually, just before, I think that <coughs> Ambassador Lu, uh, both Ambassador Lu and uh, Peter already, you know, uh, uh, described the strategic relationship between Canada and China. I appreciate. Uh, for China, actually, you know that as an uh, uh, important emerging economic power in the world, actually we appreciated a lot a series of uh, strategic partnership, uh, especially with those uh, big economic entities. Uh, actually, Canada is belonging to G7, also the member of G20. Uh, for China now, actually, we want to promote our multilateral, you know, uh, a strategic partnership that would be the uh, very balanced and sustainable, you know, uh, international economic relationship. But personally, I think that uh, Canada 
uh, has a very unique has very unique characters uh, on economic uh, strategic relationship with China. Uh, when I come here, you know that uh, I, I found that uh, it, uh, your capital, uh, Ottawa, uh, meaning is trade, and uh, uh, today you know that China already becomes the biggest. Uh, uh, traders in the world in goods. Uh, of course, uh, trading services for China is, is quite small. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, Canada, your capital is, is trade, <laughs> is trader. And China, uh, in the near future, we have to promote uh, trade and investment uh, liberalization and uh, facilitation. Uh, so uh, we have to promote, you know, our bilateral uh, strategic trade relationship uh, in the near future. Especially consider that uh, China's very big potential, you know, market growth in the future. As well as uh, uh, Canada, you know, you can provide uh, a lot of, you know, uh, services and resources and goods. Uh, at here, I just like to emphasize the potential of Chinese market. Uh, according to Jetler from Japan, Jetler uh, prediction, uh, in the near future, China will have uh, at least uh, 300 million middle class. So, uh, can you imagine this population, middle class scale? That equal to the total population in Latin American countries as well as in other countries. Especially now in China, our middle class uh, start to grow in rapidly. Especially now, China wants to promote our uh, accelerate our urbanization process. So China's middle class, their consumption tendency will be very strong. So you can see this from China's tourist purchasing power as well as you know China's luxury products purchasing in the world. Uh, of course, in China now, we, we have to encourage China's consumers to uh, have their sustainable consumption pattern in the future. Uh, one, in one word, as I like to say, China's consumption will be a very important uh, driving force, not only for China's uh, growth rate in the near future, but also uh, for the world. Yeah. Thank you. When China talks about having strategic partnerships, first of all, can, do you have an idea of how many countries China has strategic partnerships with? Yeah. And then secondly, what does China mean yeah. by having a strategic partnership with a given country? Okay. Uh, actually, we have our strategic dialogue with the United States for several years. And uh, two years ago, we started our uh, strategic dialogue with India. Also, we, uh, we have our strategic dialogue with Canada seven years ago, and uh, uh, Russia, uh, right, and Australia, uh, those uh, big, uh, important uh, economic power. Uh, I like to say that, uh, you know, that uh, Canada uh, has uh, a little bit uh, similarity with Australia, if you look at the size and the resources situation. But uh, you can find that uh, now, actually, Canada is found behind, you know, Canada, uh, Australia. If you look at uh, the trade in goods, trade value in goods. So I think that, uh, at, of course, in recent years, uh, the trade value between China and Canada already occupied, you know, uh, in the past on 13th uh, place. Now becomes, uh, uh, becomes eighth, uh, eighth place. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think that actually we still need to, gig, uh, to dig our very big potential, you know, uh, trade relationship in the near future. Especially, uh, I think that now China is uh, uh, promoting our free trade, uh, uh, free, free trade agreement uh, strategy. Uh, in American continents, uh, we already uh, signed uh, China, Chile, China, Peru. China Costa Rica uh, free trade agreement. Uh, actually, uh, next one maybe will be the uh, Colombia. Uh, I think that in the near future, China will formulate at least uh, three network of FTA with other countries. 
Uh, first one is our East Asia Free Trade Agreement uh, uh, Network. You, you know we are promoting China Korea, CJK, FTA, as well as RCEP. Uh, in American uh, con continent, uh, we will form, also we will formulate our free trade uh, network. I hope in the near future, Canada uh, could be one of them. Also, we have our, uh, we are making efforts to negotiate FTA with uh, in EU. Uh, we are promoting uh, China Island, uh, China Swiss, as well as China Norway uh, bilateral free trade agreement. So I do believe that uh, in the future, uh, we will formulate our global free trade you know, uh, network. Well, the countries you mentioned in South America with which you have free trade agreements are precisely the ones that Canada already has FTAs with. I want to come back to the issue of a Canada-China free trade agreement, or call it what you will, comprehensive economic partnership. Peter Harder uh, has made a very strong uh, plea for us to take a closer look and to, to move forward on that question, so I will come back to that issue. But let me ask Mark uh, Bolger from the EDC to just paint the picture of the bilateral economic relationship so that we get a sense of how important a free trade agreement might be. Can you tell us, Mark, um, well, broadly, how, how important is China for the Canadian economy? Uh, and I think some of you may know the answer already, but talk also about how sustainable uh, the recent attention to China uh, might be, given that uh, the world, uh, the U.S. economy in particular, is, uh, is recovering. There are signs of uh, a rebound. Uh, and whether that recovery of the American economy might cause Canadian companies to default, to, uh, to revert to the default, which is to focus on the U.S. market again and to therefore neglect China and other Asian economies. Thanks, Yu Pao. Um, I, mean, it's, I don't think it's any surprise to anyone. I mean, China is, is very critical to the Canadian economy. It's, it's our second largest trading partner uh, behind the U.S., and this, uh, this position has, has rapidly increased over the last uh, 10 years. Um, uh, from, from the perspective of, of EDC, um, we've seen you know, trade with exports from China double between the period of 2008 to, to where we are today from about $10 billion to last year about uh, $20 billion. Uh, we still remain very much resource oriented. Again, that's no surprise. Canada has vast resources uh, that, uh, that China can use and that goes into the industrial inputs that uh, Canada benefits from, from its imports uh, from China. Uh, but what has been surprising, well, what has been a, a, a seen as a shift is as the U.S. economy deteriorated and the European economy deteriorated over the last, uh, over the last several years, uh, the number of Canadian companies, the number of clients that we've had, have shifted some of their focus over to China, as, as Yun Pao had mentioned. Um, the number of our clients that have requested our support have increased, uh, have increased considerably. Our trade volumes have increased considerably. Um, this isn't just happening at the big player level. This is actually happening at the small and medium-sized segment. A lot of the Canadian companies that I've had the, uh, the privilege to, to interact with have said that you know, they've, they've received a wake-up call. They have to diversify, and, and, and Peter Harder had, had talked about di the, the, the theme of diversification. Uh, this is very much true. Uh, the question becomes, how sustainable is that? Uh, Last year, we saw a bit of a flattening in terms of the number of our clients that were, uh, the number of, of uh, the increase in the number of, of Canadian companies engaged. Um, that's not to be unexpected, uh, given that there was another little wobble in, I think, people's uh, perceptions of overall global economic health. But 2013, I think, will be the, the bellwether mm. indicator as to how, how, uh, how sustainable this, this diversification trend will be. Mm -hmm. um, you, have, you have a lot of focus on, on places like India developing. Mm -hmm. uh, you have uh, the reemergence of the U.S. economy. Mm -hmm. uh, so will that diversification message stick? Right. Uh, That's on, a big question. Honestly, it's the big question. Yeah, and I'm going yeah. to turn to our corporate uh, panelists in a minute to get their perspective on the uh, sustainability, if you will, of the uh, China and Asia focus more generally. But let me ask you also about the importance of two-way investment. Uh, 
in the Canada-China relationship. Can you say something about that? Yeah, uh, the investment side has, has tracked along with the trade side. We've seen Canadian investment increase in China. Um, it's happening very much at the, uh, at the manufacturing sector. As China's economy has developed, um, you're seeing an awful lot of Canadians look to China as an area that the Chinese consumer becomes a target. And so uh, Canadian investment is taking, is, is moving away from using China as a low cost manufacturer of goods and more starting to look at China as an actual consumer base. Right. And so that's a very interesting trend that, that we've Which noticed. Which is precisely what Dr. Huang mm -hmm. is uh, anticipating for the Chinese economy 10 years from now. Yeah. And one would have to imagine that if uh, Canadian companies are setting up presence, a domestic presence in China, that makes it uh, harder for them to retract. Uh, in other words, sort of the commitment is more, uh, more sunk in and uh, hence potentially more sustainable. Of course, two of the companies that are most invested in China are with us, are represented here by Pierre Pune from Bombardier and Michael Landry from Manulife. So maybe I can start with Pierre. And the question is not so much what is Bombardier doing in China. You're doing lots and it's growing all the time. But can you tell us how China has become strategic for the company? and how it's reflected in the corporate decisions that are being made and the incentives for managers, senior managers like yourself. How, how is Asia broadly, but China more specifically, uh, being built into the DNA of the organization so that China becomes make or break for the company as opposed to just another market that Bombardier sells to. Can you say a bit about that? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for the, uh, the opportunity. For, for Bombardier, there's no doubt that uh, China is a long-term and a strategic uh, partner going forward. I won't repeat uh, you know, our, our presence, our investments that we have uh, done in, uh, in China, but we have a number of joint ventures. We have a number of wholly owned uh, companies. We're engaged in uh, all sorts of projects going from industrial projects to sales activities, uh, engineering projects, uh, procurement as well, sourcing from, uh, from China, uh, not only for the Chinese market, but really from uh, a global market uh, point of view. And that's a message I wanted to leave with, uh, with you as well. Uh, for us, uh, we're looking at China not only through the lenses of the bilateral relationship from a trade and investment point of view, but also with in mind very much the global Market. So some of our projects are essentially getting some input or partnerships with the Chinese for, uh, for instance, our aircraft programs or our train programs, not only for the Chinese market, the demand, the huge demand that exists there, but also uh, with uh, very much in mind the global uh, market. Uh, from, from our standpoint, we, too, we see two center pieces to, uh, to this uh, strategic relationship with, uh, with China. Uh, one centerpiece is around technology. Uh, I think not only for us, but for technology companies in, uh, in Canada, China offers tremendous human uh, and financial resources to be a partner of choice for Canada on the technology front. Uh, it provides scale, uh, and it has shown an inclination in the past to leapfrog technologies as well. I think in the wireless sector that is well, well known, uh, to use an example that applies to Bombardier, very high-speed uh, train technology. Uh, Bombardier has participated in, in a number of very high-speed train projects in Europe, uh, the TGV, the uh, ICE uh, from, uh, from Germany, the AVE from, uh, from Spain. But uh, until recently, we didn't own our own brand, our own technology. We were part of a consortium for every of these uh, projects. But uh, the opportunity that China has provided to us as a, as a partner, uh, it's to, to develop our own technology in conjunction with the Chinese, with our own brand that we call the Zephyro. So we were awarded uh, a $4 billion contract through a joint venture that we have in China to develop this very high-speed train technology for the Chinese uh, market. So we're currently working on this, uh, this project and we expect to be able to deliver uh, the train. Uh, the train will enter in revenue uh, service uh, this, uh, this year. Um, so that's one example of uh, how, uh, from a technology point of view, China can really push the, the envelope and become a strategic partner for, uh, for Bombardier. The other centerpiece of our relationship is really investment. Um, I, I think it's well known that uh, 
I think the turning point was 2008, when uh, sales through foreign affiliates, Canadian foreign affiliates, exceeded exports, mm -hmm. uh, with the exception of the United States. I think EDC has done some studies on, on that. And Bombardier is no exception to, uh, to that. And I think we have to look uh, through the prism, not only of our export relationship with China, but our investment relationship. There is no doubt that the success that we're having in China would not be possible without the investments that we have made. We're making sales through our investments, through our joint ventures, uh, in a way, uh, because we, we, we're active in sectors that are considered strategic for the Chinese. They've made some choices, they've picked winners, uh, they've invested in strategic industries, and it happens that we operate in those in industries. So there are, there are some challenges and a framework that we have to operate uh, within that, that had us uh, invest in China and form joint ventures. But uh, there's no question that, that this is a track that, uh, that, in our view, us and other companies should really focus on to take uh, our relationship to the next uh, level. And I would add financing to, to that. And I'll, I'll finish by just giving a very specific uh, example. In the current uh, credit uh, crunch environment and, uh, and banks that are submitted to, uh, to new capital ratio requirements, more stringent capital ratio requirements, the Basel III requirements, in, in, in the field that we operate, like aircraft financing, we're seeing uh, banks, particularly from Europe, withdrawing from that, uh, that space. And, and now China has become a, a, a potent uh, potential partner to finance aircraft transactions, not only in China, but on a global uh, stage. So we have developed relationship with Chinese banks with very, very much this in, uh, in mind, like ICBC, Mingxiang, and, and others. And uh, we would applaud the, you know, the efforts of EDC uh, in that direction as well. You have a collaborative MOU with China Development Bank. And I think uh, from our perspective, this is very much uh, part of the future. As so a, China as well. is important for Bombardier, not, be, not just because of the Chinese market, but because of your global operations. Indeed. This is the whole story of China being a global player and being of global significance rather than just being a large uh, market. But can you just say, uh, for those who may be skeptical about um, Canadian investment abroad, particularly Canadian investment in China, it's clear that your investments in China are good for China and they're good for Bombardier, but why are they good for Canada? Can you talk about some of the backward linkages and why this is crucial for Bombardier and other Canadian companies to also think about? Yes. Well, I talked about uh, the scale of the market. Uh, and I know sometimes it's hard to internalize. You look at, at China from the prism of a, of a country. Um, so, so, you know, for the first time in, in world's history, you have 1.3 billion people living or being managed within one single political uh, entity. But in reality, it's, it's a continent. I think you have to look at China through the prism of a, of a continent, a continental perspective on, on, this, uh, on this country. Uh, there's a, a book uh, uh, on uh, the, the aerospace industry development in China written by uh, an American journalist called uh, James uh, Follows, published last year, it's called Airborne China. Yeah. And he's making some, some comments about, uh, in order to help us internalize the scale of the market, and I think he's citing another author, uh, comparing China to the United States in terms of geographical space, mm -hmm. but then you have to, to put in, in that space the whole population of the Americas, mm -hmm plus Japan with 130 million people, plus Nigeria with 150 million people to get the size of the population of China. China's GDP, the, 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 the scale of its economy, is uh, four times uh, bigger than Africa, the whole uh, of Africa, two times bigger than South America. So th that's, I think, that's the outlook that you need to have uh, on, on China. So the scale, I think it's a matter for us, you know, you, you can, you can choose to ignore, stay here. But sooner or later, I think China, you'll be confronted to, to, uh, to, to China as a competitor or as a potential partner, even though you stay here. And I think uh, by, by, by partnering, by tackling the market uh, as an OEM as, uh, as well, I think we represent an opportunity for uh, Canadian firms, as, as Peter pointed out, the SMEs, to also uh, uh, 
get involved in our supply chain, in our uh, global value chain that we are developing in conjunction with the Chinese. So. Yeah, we, we may need to have a deeper discussion about why um, uh, more robust economic ties with China, particularly Canadian investment in China is good for Canada and Canadians, particularly if we move, try to move forward on this idea of a free trade agreement with China. Obviously, public opinion is going to be a big determinant about whether the government uh, has, has the courage and the political will to push forward. So we'll come back to the issue of uh, Canada-China FTA shortly, but I want to go to Michael now, who represents uh, Manual Life, and Manual Life has been in China even longer than Bombardier, over 100 years, I believe. Uh, you, you are almost a Chinese company. Tell us about the strategic importance of China for the company and the way in which Manual Life places importance to it. Well, there, the importance goes back, as you say, to 1897. Uh, in fact, Manual Life. Uh, going into China in 1897 uh, with the uh, approval of our board of directors and actually Sir John A. Macdonald was our first president and signed the, the board minute allowing us to do that. And He's bragging, right? <laughs> <laughs> but the important, the, an important stat, I think that even back, even today, there are very few companies that could say that they would enter China before they enter the United States which is effectively what John A. MacDonald said to our company, we're, we're going to the Far East. Uh, we were there for 50 years um, and established obviously very, very deep roots. Uh, at the, uh, during the World War II, we, were, we had to exit. And then back in the early 90s, uh, we actually gained our next license in 1996. So we feel that uh, as to reflect comments earlier, Peter, the ambassador, that deep roots and commitment and loyalty are very important parts of a strategy. And so China is as embedded in our way of thinking, uh, the values of our company, um, as any jurisdiction that we operate in. Uh, in 1996, we uh, did receive our first license of the new era, if you will. Uh, and have continued to pursue, to pursue our strategy. We are now in 50 cities. I don't think there's another insurance company that is in as many cities as we are. Um, and that will continue to grow. I think we're estimating the next five to 10 years we could be in 100 cities in China. Um, once you hit that scale, once you hit the numbers of employees, the numbers of uh, people who sell our product, who may be independent distributors or through bank channels and so forth, uh, it, you are embedded into that country and into the culture. We operate through Chinese companies. Virtually everybody who is a Manulife employee in China uh, is Chinese uh, national. Uh, there are a few uh, of, uh, of Western people that, then that's important to us because they understand the Manulife way, if you will. But ultimately, when uh, you are in China, you see Manulife, uh, our Manulife Sinochem Insurance Company, Manulife Taida, our wealth management company, or our distribution agreement through Bank of China, the commercial bank, uh, you're really looking at Chinese companies. Um, when our geographies are here in Canada, the United States, and Asia. Uh, with growth rates that are being experienced in Asia, it's easy to see why our pie now is equally distributed between Canada, the US, and Asia. And by far fastest growing region is Asia. Uh, and one could argue that China's growth rate, is it going to be eight, is it going to be seven and a half percent? Compared to, uh, Western growth rates, that is, those are very high levels uh, of, of growth that will continue our trajectory forward. And then when you look a little bit below that to our specific markets, uh, they may, they, the growth rates in the areas where we operate in China make those numbers look very small. We talk here about the emerging middle class. Well, there is an existing huge middle class in China. That market uh, is looking for the kinds of products that we sell. Uh, people reach certain levels of, 
um, economic prosperity and their, their financial needs are the financial needs that we all face, whether it's sa uh, savings for retirement, savings for their children's education, saving life insurance against catastrophe, and other such things. Uh, they want different vehicles that they can invest and save their monies in. That's where our wealth management um, um, initiatives will, will really come to the fore. We are in the 50 cities, I think there are 400 million people who we can look at and say they're there either today or tomorrow is a customer of ours. So uh, in terms of strategic importance to our company, I think that tells the story. Yes. And the relationships that uh, are so key that were talked about, I think are probably as important in China as they are anywhere in the world. I think our success in part has been one, we were very early. We took a chance, if you will, when many others would not. Uh, the relationships that we built um, ourselves are critical. The relationship that we've talked about this morning, Canada, very, very special relationship between Canada and China has been huge. Um, and maintaining them and the, that loyalty that's been built through that process, I think we all as Canadians in whatever field we are in uh, continue to benefit and I think for the very long term will benefit. You, you talked about the, uh, the pie being divided more or less equally among the three major markets, Canada, US and, and Asia. A uh, third, is this of sales of of, uh, it, 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 yeah. Roughly, yeah? Yes, okay. the business that we have operating there. Right, and that's also the largest, the fastest growing uh, segment of the pie. Yes. So it's hard to imagine that uh, to the original question that we started with about the risk of, uh, of uh, Canadian companies uh, reverting to the default. I mean, I cannot possibly imagine that you know, when such a big share of your business is already coming from China and Asia generally that there would be any uh, slackening of attention to Asia and, and China more specifically. Uh, let me then now get to the question of how we deepen the Canada-China relationship in a strategic manner. Of course, uh, there are all various companies are already doing what they can to try to increase export sales. The government of Canada, of course, is sending uh, ministers and officials on a regular basis. Uh, we've expanded our commercial diplomatic presence uh, in, in China. Uh, but what are the strategic measures that we can take to deepen the relationship, to sort of raise it to a new level, as somebody said? And one of the uh, stepping stones, if you will, was a study that was done, uh, well, it's been in the works for a number of years, but it was released last year. It's called the Canada-China Economic Complementarity Study. One could describe it as a feasibility study for a free trade agreement, but I said that, nobody else did. Uh, maybe I can ask Mark to comment on the complementarity study. You, you weren't directly involved, I know, but just say a bit about what some of the sectors were, or other sectors that you can think about where there are really powerful long-term reasons for focusing on and develop, developing this kind of strategic outlook. Sure. Um, well, the, 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 studies, the birth of the study came out of a discussion between Prime Minister Harper, or sorry, uh, Minister Fast, and uh, at the time, uh, Minister of Commerce Chen in China. And they wanted to have a look at where were their economic similarities that could be leveraged between Canada's trade with China, China's trade with Canada, and sort of the, the, the shared, uh, the, the, the shared uh, nuances that exist between, between them. Uh, they, they focused on seven main sectors, um, and they're actually pretty broad. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, uh, transportation infrastructure, uh, machinery and equipment, textiles, agri-food, the services sector, and natural resources. And so those are all pretty big buckets. Um, but what they did is, is delve down a little bit further into them to see where those linkages exist between what Canada is selling to China and what China is, is selling back to Canada. Um, they're all great, they're all key sectors for the Canadian economy. Um, I, I think the important takeaway was it was the beginning of a dialogue on where we could go from there. Um, obviously, there needs to be some more work done on 
what specific areas would present the best opportunities. Certainly, we talked about a few of them here today already. Uh, the services sector is certainly booming. Uh, financial services, everything. Every time you do a trade transaction, there's there's transportation services involved. There's a whole of, whole host of logistical services involved as well. Uh, tourism, uh, as as uh, as the ambassador mentioned this morning, uh, the number of tourism uh, tourists coming to Canada will increase. Does Canada actually have the infrastructure to support that? Right. I think that's a, that's a key question on an area of focus going forward. Um, looking at the China five-year plan, or sorry, the, the, yeah, the 12th China, 12, uh, yeah. 12th five-year plan. Mm -hmm. uh, China is focused on moving from a, a, a export at all costs sort of uh, growth to a more, trying to increase the, the health and, and well-being of their citizens. Part of that's being driven by, of course, the rapid uh, urbanization that's occurring, but it's leading to some really key opportunities for Canada. Um, environmental, the environmental sector is right. one, and we've already seen that in uh, EDC, seen that in some of the engagement our clients are doing with China. Mm -hmm. uh, environmental technologies, um, health services in, uh, increasing as well. Um, certainly, resources is going to play, continue to play a strong role. But it's the more value-added segments which right. uh, are presenting the, the, the newest opportunities for, for Canada and China trade. Of course, to uh, access those opportunities, the Chinese government is going to have to liberalize some of these sectors <laughs> in order to allow foreign participation. And uh, Wang uh, Yukon, uh, you know the Chinese government well. You were, were, were the World Bank representative. You talked about a Chinese economy 10 years from now that is going to be more consumption-driven. Presumably, that means more service sector activity. I'm assuming that you, you've factored in, you've built in some degree of liberalization. Is this realistic? Are the Chinese really going to open up some of these sectors so that they, that, sec that uh, consumer spending becomes more efficient? I, I think that a realist would have to say that countries liberalize or open up because it's in their own interests. Right. It's a lot easier to do so. So the question is, as China prospers, develops, and grows, how strong is the benefits coming from liberalization? Let me take financial services. Right now, I would say globally, people are saying that China has not liberalized enough in terms of financial services. It's opened uh, up the economy a lot in terms of agricultural inputs. It's been very open to trade in commodities uh, and goods. Uh, but financial services are not as open as one would expect. And the answer to this is the following. Part of the argument that uh, Premier Zhu Wangji made uh, 10 years ago was that the China's banks and financial services had to improve and get to a certain stage of being strong enough. And when that occurred, then opening up the financial sector would be in the interest of China. And I think that's starting to happen. Why is it in China's interest to open up financial services? It's not a fact. It's the fact is that when you open up your financial services and you bring in foreign companies, it actually makes Chinese companies stronger. It generates more demand for Chinese experts. It's not a, a win-lose situation, it's a win-win. So China's reached that stage where opening up the financial services is a benefit. China's already opened up a lot of the consumer distribution wholesale activities. So you see lots of foreign companies, Costco's, and, and these big warehouses coming to China. It's improving and changing the game there. Uh, so I think that this liberalization is now coming. It'll happen. It'll be supported by the Chinese because they themselves will benefit, they from, benefit this. from it. Okay, good. That's encouraging. Professor Chang, why does China want a free trade agreement with Canada? So many countries to choose from. Why Canada? Yeah. Uh, you know that uh, uh, today uh, China's economy is already melting into a world economy. Actually, besides that, uh, in China, our opening reform and opening up for 30 years that's also the process of China's economy uh, melting into world economy. And uh, given this, that means uh, we have to allocate all economic factors in, on the uh, regional platform as well as a global platform. Uh, that's general uh, description. Uh, also, <clears throat> uh, I, I like to say that if you look at China's economic structure, you can find that today, China is already becomes the real uh, world economic manufacturing center. Uh, manufacturer contributed China's GDP 
uh, more than 46%. Uh, uh, if you look at the service sector, uh, just uh, uh, 44%. Uh, this 44, all, uh, we get this 44 because last year we increased 1% of service sector's contribution to GDP. Also, we uh, decreased 1% of our <coughs> manufacturer's contribution. So uh, now our uh, Premier Wen Jiabao uh, uh, repeated several times. He said that uh, China's economic development uh, is not sustainable in the future. It's, it's unbalanced. So in order to make China's economic growth and economic development more sustainable in the future, we have to restruct China's economy, and we have to change our economic growth model. So that means in China, according to our twice five-year plan, every year we want to reduce 1% of our, manu our manufacturing sector uh, contribution. Mm. Uh, meanwhile, increase 1% of service sector's contribution. Mm. That means we have to uh, invest in other countries. We have to transfer our overcapacity of production. Also, we have to seek, seek you know, our energy saving and, uh, 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 and uh, uh, pollutant emission. So that's very tough, uh, tough mission for, for China, both for uh, government and uh, our enterprises. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so consider this type of situation. I think that FTA <clears throat> will provide a very good platform for China's <coughs> enterprises, as well as for other, uh, you know, other countries' enterprises operated in China. Uh, you know that uh, <coughs> I think that uh, in China, our actually our service sectors gradually opened. Uh, you know that WTO promoted China's service sectors opening up. Uh, the SEPA. Uh, actually, that's our comprehensive economic partnership with Hong Kong, mm -hmm. as well as Macau. That, in that, if you look at that agreement, you can find that uh, service sector's uh, opening up degree is the highest one, mm -hmm. because SEPA already upgraded from uh, SEPA 1 to SEPA 9. Mm -hmm. Also, you can find that uh, China-Chile free trade agreement, uh, China-ASEAN free trade agreement uh, regarding service sector's opening up uh, already gradually uh, upgrading. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that you know that in Canada, your service sector has contributed your economy more than maybe 87%, mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. Your manufacturers are just uh, 13%. So I think that in the future, uh, financial sectors, as well as aviation sectors, they will, you know, they, they can perform better in Chinese market in the future if you have this uh, bilateral free trade agreement. Also, I think that uh, your human resources, uh, just before Peter mentioned the successful story of Da Shan in China and your Celine Dion performance in China. Mm. Actually, if you uh, regarded this phenomenon belonging to service uh, sectors cooperation, in the future, I think that uh, your culture products mm. also will occupy the Chinese market. That will boom your economy. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I'm going to open it up to questions uh, now. I just want to make a comment that what we've heard from uh, Professor Chang and Professor Huang, in a sense, is that uh, the, the Chinese interest in uh, a free trade agreement with Canada is in part a selfish interest to liberalize their own economy uh, rather than one that is about, if you will, prying open the Canadian market. I mean, this is open to debate, uh, and now I want to invite questions, starting with our uh, Weibo guests. Are, yes. are we live on yes, this? Yes, please. Uh, starting with our Weibo question, of course, this conference is being followed by all of us, but also the, uh, some Weibo tweeting uh, to China and uh, our tweeters here in Canada. So the Weibo question, to start off the, that interaction, uh, and the question from China, which is uh, quite um, prescient as to what's going on in Canada and what the opportunities are that they are perhaps missing out on is, how do we get Tim Hortons into the Chinese <laughs> market? <laughs> uh, for our American and Chinese guests, Tim Hortons is a, a very well-known 
uh, coffee and donut chain, Dunkin' Donuts of Canada. I don't know if that's fair to say it that way. Uh, I don't know who to direct this question to. <laughs> isn't Tim Hortons an American company? Is it still? <laughs> Not anymore. It's come back, isn't it? Yeah. Mom, do you want to take a crack at that? Wow. Um. <laughs> No, let me just say that uh, we have examples of Canadian uh, food service companies, yeah. very successful in China. Uh, Blends is one that jumps to mind. Yeah. You may have done some financing for them. Can you think of other companies in the food services business that have been successful in China? Uh, not, in, not that immediately comes to mind, but I, I was going to make the point that what I've seen in the last, uh, in the last uh, three, four years is um, uh, a level of confidence that's been building amongst the uh, amongst the retail segment uh, to look at China. Um, again, this is driven in part by the realization there's actually a consumer base there, uh, but also in some of the regulatory changes that have occurred to make things such as as franchising uh, more more appealing. Um, I'd have to just say that one of the bigger challenges for Canada, uh, for Canadian companies being small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, is is um, is just the costs involved in being able to establish a, a presence overseas. Um, the further you go in distance, even harder it, harder it becomes. So, you know, it, when you share a similar language like the United States and it's our nearest neighbor, those things can be somewhat easier to to uh, to swallow. But when you have to deal with uh, distances, it, it, quite different cultural aspects, languages. Um, you, those become very, right. very interesting challenges for small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, the other thing that uh, that is always top of mind for for Canadian companies, and this is, believe it or not, somewhat uniquely Canadian, is intellectual property rights is is top of mind for Canada. Um, this isn't the same for United States and for Europe. When you when businesses are asked what are their top five challenges uh, in doing business in China. IP, IP doesn't even come into the top five, mm, yeah. uh, but for Canada, it's number one. Yes. Uh, whether that's an issue that's driven by just all the press that Canada has, has seen and it's been embedded, embedded in the psyche, or a lack of dialogue on the matter and understanding uh, the Chinese uh, rules and regulations, um, that is, that's, that's certainly something that uh, the Canadian companies uh, need to look at. Yeah. So. Thank you, Mark. Um, it's actually not that crazy a question when you think that uh, presumably the Weipo questioner is in China asking this question. This is a person who has been exposed to Tim Hortons, perhaps being a tourist here or being a student here. And in fact, one of the very interesting developments I've noticed about uh, the way in which people flows can create trade flows is that when Asian visitors, students, tourists, uh, uh, long-term temporary residents spend time in this country, they develop tastes in this country which they then want to uh, to partake of when they go back to their home countries. And so we have a phenomenon, for example, of white spot. Those of you who are from BC will know white spot. It's a famous burger. Uh, it's a huge success in Hong Kong. Why? Because so many Hong Kong residents have spent time in Vancouver getting used to white spot. So it makes entire sense that a company built on a provincial business has been able to transfer the taste to a population that was exposed to it through travel and through uh, study. And it's not inconceivable at all that the same could be true of Tim Hortons. Okay, uh, we have a question here and then others please take up your line behind the mics and we'll go to you. Uh, Exactly three months ago today, December 22nd, the Globe and Mail in Canada published a full page feature story about an interesting Greek Canadian singer who performs in China under the name Chairman George. <laughs> that singer is in fact me, <laughs> Chairman George, and I have the Globe story right here. I tell my friends in China that I'm Chairman George, not Chairman Mao. But they're not convinced because they all think I'm Mr. Bean. Mm. I'd like to ask you, I'm currently actually negotiating in Beijing right now an endorsement deal with a Chinese import company whereby 
with my original music, I would endorse their product in China, Greek olive oil, on nationally televised commercials across China. My question for the panel, what do you think of this Canadian combination of cultural and economic entrepreneurship? And would you have any advice to help me seal the deal? Shashia. <laughs> I don't know which one of our panelists would like to... Uh, <laughs> do you have any comments of EDC? Uh? Not, not, not from EDC, but I, uh, I, I commend you on a, on a, on a very interesting and, and great example of, uh, of, of the need for cultural combinations in order to be successful. Um, what, I've, what I found in just going back to the, to the, the food and the Tim Hortons uh, Tim Horton's example earlier is uh, those companies that succeed the best in China um, and in other countries as well adapt themselves locally. Uh, so while they while they keep their brand, uh, their their chairman George, um, they've 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 adapted themselves to to local to local tastes. Uh, so um, 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 I think I think you're on the right track in terms of understanding and and and, and accounting for culture. Um, but I'd leave it up to other panelists that may have uh, other inspirations for you. Well, I think Professor Chang already mentioned that there is a market for um, foreign performers uh, and foreign personalities to have a, a presence in the Chinese market, uh, either in their own right or in promoting Chinese products. And you only have to spend 20 minutes watching Chinese TV to, to see that. Is that, is that correct? Uh, yes. Uh, actually, you know that in China, uh, uh, our market uh, has a very big and potential uh, demand for overseas, uh, you know, cultural products and arts uh, products and performance. Uh, in my mind, uh, at the beginning of this new year, uh, Beijing Television, uh, that, that's, uh, you know, the local uh, television uh, station. Uh, their New Year uh, programs, uh, gala, actually half of those performances uh, made by foreigners. I was very amazing for that. Because I mentioned our, you know, Eve Gala. Uh, in that, uh, you know, Spring Festival uh, all, uh, uh, for all over country made by CCTV, uh, foreign performance uh, like Celine Dion, just quite limited a few you know, perform performers from uh, other countries. But for Beijing, because Beijing <laughs> wants to be a world city, <laughs> world metropolitan, they are very ambitious to promote you know, internationalize. Uh, this is one thing. Another thing is that uh, uh, now in China, a lot of uh, youngers, they, they love, they deeply love you know, those uh, movies, those songs from you know Hollywood as well as from even if from South Korea, you know that actually in the history, actually China, Chinese culture has a very strong you know impact on Chinese uh, on ROK culture, mm. and uh, we exported our you know products to <laughs> ROK. But today, Chinese market can accept so a lot of dramas and movies, you know, from ROK. So that means, I think that, you know, that uh, because the Chinese population is so big and they have their diversified demand, so I do believe that uh, your products also will be welcomed. Uh, fi finally, I, I like to say that uh, if we can promote uh, bilateral FTA negotiation, that means your, uh, your cultural products also uh, will be, it would be easier to access Chinese market. Also, you, not only your products, but also those products made by other companies also will have their uh, market opportunities, more and more opportunities. Thank Nikon, you. you have a comment as well? I don't have a specific solution or advice to Chairman George, but I think that the, 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 the timing is such that initiatives like yours are, are more likely to bear fruit than they would have in the past. I wanted to make one observation about this, uh, the commercial business relationships between Canada and China. As, you, as people pointed out here, you have a very strong, obviously a strong relationship with Canada and the United States. 
and both of these are going to be uh, sources of strength in the future. What I would think that Canadians need to think about this not as Canada, China, Canada, United States. They need to think about this as a triangle. What we learn from the production sharing network in Asia is that you gain huge specialization in profits and economies of scale by focusing on parts and components that move across countries, not just once, sometimes multiple times. And I think the really interesting question for Canada is to realize that it has a very close link with the US. It has actually a privileged position with China because China's perceptions of Canada are different than the perceptions of the US in ways which are positive. So not only do you have raw materials, but you have a technology, skill base, service quality, which is of high standard, and politically, frankly, less threatening. Mm. And this means that you can capture product lines and relationships which link China, Canada, the United States in ways which neither country can do so directly. Mm. There's actually a huge potential for countries that can fulfill that bill, and you will have this proximity advantage. Mm. And in Asia, we've learned that in terms of relationship between a South Korea or a Taiwan or Japan or a Thailand. And not only do products, technical expertise, and logistics move one direction, they move back and forth multiple times. And each time they move, they capture value. And I see here, when I look at the complementarity study, a lot of potential for building upon those links which have not yet been captured. Thank you, Yukon. And Thank you. I'm Anne Weston um, from the International Development Research Center. My question really builds on the issue that was just raised at an individual level, but to think about um, where within the free trade agreement framework we might address some of the issues that relate to the movement of people. Mm -hmm. And so I suppose my question is twofold. On the one hand, for the Chinese, from the Chinese experience, you've got num a number of free trade agreements in, let's say, South America. So where do you within the context of these free trade agreements, if anywhere, deal with the issue of the movement of people, skilled people, mm. semi-skilled people, and how, what lessons might that have for Canada? And then from the Canadian perspective, in the complementarity study, has this been an issue that's been raised um, in the context of a free trade framework, or should we be really thinking about mechanisms outside free trade agreements for looking at the problems that affect the movement of people between Canada and China? That's a Thank great you. question. Uh, so has labor mobility been part of free trade agreements in general for China, and how could it be a part of the Canada-China agreement? Uh, actually, uh, you, uh, you know that uh, when we uh, negotiate FTA with other countries, uh, uh, for different countries, maybe we have different uh, frameworks. Uh, and uh, I like to say that for FTA negotiation, uh, trading goods, trading services and the investment agreement will be the main chapters. And of course, we, uh, generally speaking, we have our international cooperation chapters uh, in, in which uh, the uh, uh, labor movement, business people movement will be emphasized. And also, uh, there will be your negotiation on this type of issues. But, uh, uh, if you look at the uh, text of those uh, free trade agreements, uh, on this aspect, uh, the, the very detailed regulation uh, is not so popular. Uh, actually, uh, the detailed you know, uh, movement regulation uh, will be made by our you know, uh, immigrant, uh, immigration control uh, agency, as well as other, you know, uh, maybe, maybe Ministry of uh, uh, Human Resources or something like that. So they will be, those type of uh, document, documentary will be complementary. Uh, uh, also, I think that, of course, uh, in the process of negotiation, free trade agreement negotiation, uh, the, uh, I do believe that uh, the labor movement uh, and as well as business uh, people movement, uh, the, how to say, the facilitation uh, must be improved uh, compared with, you know, uh, uh, compared with uh, uh, before signed, you know, uh, agreement. Uh, that, that's an important role of uh, free trade agreement on uh, people movement. Yeah. Comment from Michael and then comment from Mark. The movement of people is one of the most challenging 
and uh, issues that's paid most attention to by negotiating bodies around the world. Um, in Geneva at the World Trade Organization, uh, it certainly is one in how to affect the ability of uh, people to move. Um, um, and it gets attention in, I think, most, um, most agreements that are, that are negotiated and is only becoming more pointed. Uh, I was in Geneva this week and much of the conversation uh, that occurs there now is around what are called the 21st century issues, uh, movement of data, movement of people, and those kinds, and others, um, but it certainly is um, uh, key and will become more important and will take a bigger part of negotiations. The other thing, though, to keep in mind is that, that the distinction that has to be made, I think, between Moving, movement of people for work purposes, for temporary assignments, or to move into for projects, and immigration. Those are two quite distinct, quite separate uh, subject matters. And um, I think if we are able to keep them in their own, it, we will find that the movement of people will become a bit of an easier conversation. Yes, okay, thank you very much. I'm gonna take, uh, we've got three people at the mic, so I'll take all three questions and then we'll have a round of responses. So starting with Craig. Uh, question for particularly Dire Director jo Zhang and uh, Dr. Huang, uh, but all of the panelists to act as seers, look out 10 years, what would be a target that you would set or you believe is achievable for Canada to be a strategic partner with China? And I, if I could give you a context, when I left Beijing the first time in 1988, our trade was 50% larger than Australia's. It overtook us in four years. They're now, I believe, China's eighth largest trading partner. Canada dropped last year from 12th to 13th behind India. So my question would be, where can we go? What's achievable? And from the Chinese perspective, what, is, what does it really mean to be a strategic partner of China? Okay, thank you. And then Ken Sunquist. Very quick, uh, Ambassador Liu uh, said that together we go farther. Peter gave probably the best speech I've heard him give on the topic. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Uh, but I'd like to ask this panel, and perhaps even pinning uh, Pao Wu a little bit on this one, you know, you don't, you're not the only one who can ask the questions, right? Now we're asking questions. Uh, the complementary study really has three possible outcomes. We do nothing, we do a sector, uh, FTA, or you even go farther. I mean, there's a range. If we were to go down the path of doing nothing, how does that affect the larger relationship? We're gonna be talking about a little bit more in security that maybe we should ask the other panels the same question. Where we are right now, how does that affect the Canada-China relationship? Okay, great question. Please, if you'd introduce yourself. Yeah. Uh, my name is Chris Merritt, I'm at Environment Canada. Hmm. Uh, but this is more of a personal question. Hmm. Um, considering the, the fundamental shift in the Chinese economy over the course of the next 15 years and the coinciding of the retirement of the baby boomers and the impact that that would have, what can the Chinese government and also the Canadian government do to facilitate, uh, I guess, a shift to the importance of Generation X and Generation Y to be able to sort of take the unofficial reins of the relationship so it can be beneficial for both countries? Hmm. Great, great question, and in fact, it jives nicely with the first question about what the Canada-China strategic relationship might look like 10 years from now. Well, 10 years from now, we have another generation of, of leaders on both sides. I, what I'll do is I'll, I'll give everyone a chance to comment on either the questions or anything else that you've heard, and uh, we'll wrap up with that. So if I could uh, start, Professor Chang. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, from my point of view, I think that uh, uh, this year, actually, I hope this year could be the uh, turn point of China, Canada, uh, Canada uh, strategic relationship. Uh, you know that uh, we have already seven years, uh, you know, strategic relationship. Uh, in China, we have a saying that is "qi nian zhi yang." Uh, that is, uh, you know, that uh, <laughs> if you uh, got married for seven years, yes. uh, it, uh, there would be, you know, uh, problems to somewhat. <laughs> uh, but I don't hope this type of thing happened for uh, China, uh, Canada strategic relationship. So I, I hope our turn point uh, would go to a uh, right direction. That direction would be, you know, that this year uh, we have a very a big, you know, investment uh, event uh, this afternoon, uh, you know, uh, Nixon, uh, Nixon, you know, case happened here. 
uh, also uh, make Chinese accumulated investment here doubled. Uh, this, uh, this is a very, very important uh, event. Another is Celine Dion, you know, performed in China. <laughs> yeah, also very big event. Uh, so my, my thought is that uh, here, I like to emphasize two things. One thing is, uh, you know, that now in order to achieve sustainable development goal in China, we have to reduce uh, emission pollution and we have to save energy. I think that uh, in Canada, your you know, uh, uh, mechanical equipment uh, uh, manufacturer level uh, is quite high and you have the, your, uh, your own technology and your brand. I think environmental, uh, production, environmental production and energy saving you know, equipment uh, we will have a very big market in China. And in this, in this field, we can find our cooperation point. Uh, especially, you know, that uh, on APAC platform last year, uh, there, uh, there is uh, already have an uh, environmental products list, uh, including 45 products. And for those type of products, their, you know, uh, trade will be, you know, liberalized. And uh, I hope in the uh, near future, more and more envir environmental product products uh, could be like this. Of course, Canada can play a very important role for China on this aspect. And another is I hope, uh, you know, aviation, you know, uh, sectors cooperation uh, will be deepened continually because in China, more and more businessmen and more and more, you know, rich people, they want to own their private uh, uh, airplanes, but uh, yeah, th this market is increasing very rapidly. Also, will be a very, very you know uh, uh, potential you know growth point. So I think th this is another one. But uh, I would more appreciate appreciate on uh, service sectors. Mm -hmm. So that means you know that in the near future, our China's RMB will be internationalized. China's international, uh, China's financial sectors will be internationalized further, and in that process, uh, Canadian you know companies can explore more and more you know growth points in that process. Uh, lastly, regarding investment issues, uh, I'm very happy to say that uh, uh, two years ago, Chinese uh, uh, Forest Administration, National Forest uh, uh, Administration released our green guidelines for China's overseas investment in forest sectors. Mm -hmm. And in that guidelines, a, a, a best practice case happened in Canada, uh, Columbia province. Over there, Chinese forest investors not only log timbers, but also breed in the forest and make that, uh, make that operation sustainable in the future. Uh, meanwhile, this year, we released our uh, uh, guidelines on environmental protection for China's overseas investments uh, uh, issued by MOFCOM. And in, I think that for China's overseas investments, uh, not only in Canada, but also in other countries, we will have a right direction. We will have a better governance. In that process, I hope Canada and China can cooperate together. Thank you very Thank much. You. I've been given the warning that <clears throat> we have to wrap up in two minutes. So you, you can reserve the right not to comment, but sure. I'll quickly go through. Pierre? Yeah, a, a few comments. Uh, building on your uh, point about uh, the, uh, the potential for environmental uh, technologies, certainly from, from our standpoint, we see, we see a tremendous opportunities uh, in this area in, uh, in China. Uh, for instance, uh, according to, to our figures, uh, there are 350 cities in China of at least 300,000 people uh, in terms of uh, population. Uh, I, I'm mentioning this because it's a bit of a threshold in Europe uh, to, you know, to see cities starting using tram technologies or surface uh, light rail trains. And we're only scratching the surface uh, in, uh, in China because they've invested mostly in metro uh, systems, but also intercity uh, rail cars. And last year we signed an agreement with uh, Pujan in uh, Nanjing to license our tram technologies uh, to, uh, to, that, uh, to that company. Uh, to tap into the opportunities in, uh, in China. The second point I would mention is that uh, I think doing nothing 
uh, in relation to the question about the complementarity, st complementarity study, it's not an option. Okay. Uh, I think we can go from a full-fledged uh, free trade agreement to very pointed sectoral agreements. One area I would flag is uh, standards collaboration. Uh, I talked about a continental scale market. We're seeing demand for 1,400 business jets in the next uh, 20 years, 2,200 commercial aircraft in the segments in which we compete in the next 20 years, 18,000 kilometers of very high speed uh, trains. Uh, but for our products to be accepted, they need to be certified uh, in, in China. So to realize the potential, I think we need more of the, uh, the technical arrangements in various uh, sectors. Uh, and, and, you know, hopefully mutual recognition uh, agreements as well for uh, technical uh, standards going forward. And the last comment I would make uh, in keeping with the mm. uh, point I made about uh, technology collaboration, we have an SNT treaty with, uh, with China, but I think there's scope to expand this uh, science and technology agreement to create vested interest in technology collaboration. Uh, and I would suggest that this is an area that the governments uh, on both sides may wish to, to focus. Thank you, Pierre. Does anyone have a burning comment to make? Okay, I'm going to wrap up now and please uh, thank you for your indulgence for going abroad. Please thank our panelists.